Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. Today we are going to talk about a few very important questions from group 15 elements which is P block elements. So these questions basically will help you in the preparation of mains, NEET, CBSC or ISC examination. So let's get started with the questions without any more delay. Question number one for the class today. Nitrogen does not form pentahalide although it exhibits plus 5 oxidation state. So we are talking about the valency of nitrogen in this question. In the question they are saying that nitrogen does not form pentahalide. In case of pentahalide, the valency is expected to be 5. Which means nitrogen must be forming 5 chemical bonds in order to exist in pentahalide state. And in the question they are saying that nitrogen does not form pentahalide although it exhibits plus 5 oxidation state. So to understand the answer for this question, we need to first of all identify the difference between the concept of valency and oxidation state. So basically oxidation state is nothing but the apparent charge that can exist over any atom. And oxidation state is always not equal to valency. So valency is nothing but the number of electrons that can be lost, gained or shared during chemical bonding. When you look at nitrogen whose atomic number is 7, the configuration comes out to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. It has got half filled configuration. So that is why it is a little more stable when you compare it to any other element of the adjacent groups. But anyway, look at the valency configuration of nitrogen 2s2, 2p3. If we expand, we can write it as 2s2, 2px1, 2py1, 2pz1. Alright. So, when you look at the valency configuration of nitrogen, we see 3 unpaid electrons, which means nitrogen readily can form 3 chemical bonds or 3 covalent bonds. And coming to the rest of the two electrons that you see here, they generally exist as lone pair of electrons. But in some cases, what might happen is these lone pair of electrons can be donated into empty orbitals and this lone pair of electrons also can contribute towards chemical bonding. So including this lone pair of electrons, you have maximum 4 being covalency of this nitrogen. So nitrogen maximum can form how many bonds? Only 4 bonds. So because nitrogen does not have any other vacant orbitals in its valency shell, it can only form 4 chemical bonds and that is why it cannot form pentahalide because pentahalide is something which requires nitrogen to form 5 chemical bonds. And nitrogen doesn't have that capacity. It has got only two shells. In the second shell, you only have two orbitals. One is S and the second one is P. When you look at the count of orbitals, it is one S orbital and three P orbitals. So maximum three orbitals of P and one orbital of S can participate in bonding, which altogether is four atomic orbitals readily available for the sake of chemical bonding in nitrogen. Due to absence of any more relevant atomic orbitals, nitrogen does not form pentahalide even if it has capacity to lose all the 5 electrons. When you check oxidation state, you are observing how many electrons can be lost from entire nitrogen. All the valence electrons can be lost which means nitrogen can lose 3p electrons and 2s electrons and that's when oxidation state turns out to be plus 5. You should always not think that oxidation state is equal to valency. Oxidation state and valency are not equal in all the cases. They are different. In some cases, by coincidence, they match, but not always. Tk? And let's move on to the next question now. The next question is here. PH3 has lower boiling point than NH3. So in this question, we're going to compare boiling point of NH3 and PH3. So to look back the position of the nitrogen and phosphorus in the periodic table, nitrogen comes first and phosphorus comes later in group 15. And nitrogen's atomic number is 7, phosphorus atomic number is 15. Nitrogen has got two shells and phosphorus has got how many? Three shells, isn't it? So now you are talking about the compounds formed by nitrogen and phosphorus. So which compounds are we talking about? We are talking about the hydrides. You are talking about hydride of nitrogen and hydride of phosphorus and you are comparing their boiling point. So whenever you look at boiling point, you need to observe a few 
points for the sake of comparison. The very first point is you need to observe the molar mass. If the molar mass of the given sample is higher, the boiling point, melting point also will be higher. If the molecules that you are talking about are heavy molecules, to melt them or to boil them, you would have to supply more energy, more heat energy. That's why molar mass and boiling point are proportional to each other, are directly proportional to each other. And other than molar mass, you can also observe one other factor called as intermolecular hydrogen bonding. Intermolecular hydrogen bonding. So, if it is not molar mass which is determining or which is helping you compare boiling point, look at intermolecular hydrogen bonding. I am sure you remember what is intermolecular hydrogen bonding. This is nothing but a bond which is formed between delta positive hydrogen of one molecule and delta negative nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine of the adjacent molecule. So intermolecular hydrogen bonding can be formed between two molecules and the condition is one of them must possess this delta positive hydrogen and the other one must possess one of these delta negative species and the attraction formed between both of these units can be considered as intermolecular hydrogen bonding. So presence of this intermolecular hydrogen bonding impacts boiling points and melting points. All right. So whenever you are trying to compare boiling point, first thing look at the molar mass. If molar mass is more, the boiling point is supposed to be more. But this is always not true. There is an exceptional case of intermolecular hydrogen bonding. And in case there is a sample which is consisting of intermolecular hydrogen bonding, the melting and boiling points will be higher. So intermolecular hydrogen bonding is directly proportional to boiling points. Let us talk about NH3 and PH3 here. Let us first of all observe the molecular mass of NH3 and PH3. Ammonia molecular mass is 14 plus 7 which is 17 grams per mole and when you look at phosphine which is pH 3 the molecular mass of pH 3 is 31 plus 3 which is 34. If you observe pH 3 comparatively is a heavy molecule isn't it? According to the first relation what do we observe or what do we expect? We expect a pH 3 let us write the expectation here we expect a pH 3 because it is heavier to have high Higher boiling point than that of NH3. This is what we expect. But look at the question. In the question they are saying that pH3 has got lower boiling point than NH3. So the reality is what? Reality is pH3 having lower boiling point NH3. And in the question they are asking the reason behind this. So if the first logic doesn't work, if molecular mass is not directly proportional to boiling point in the given examples that you are comparing, then you should look at which logic? You should look at the second logic. If molecular mass directly proportional to boiling point is not working, quickly verify if your sample is having any intermolecular hydrogen bonding. So let us do the same verification for NH3 and PH3. Okay? So in case of PH3 observed, do you have got a delta positive hydrogen? Yes, there is a hydrogen which have got a partial positive charge. But do you have delta negative nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine? Is it even possible to have something like that here? No. So PH3 does not have any intermolecular hydrogen bonding. Okay? Then what about ammonia? If you have a sample of ammonia, as you already see here, nitrogen gets the delta negative charge and the hydrogen gets the delta positive charge. The nitrogen and hydrogen of the adjacent molecules can interact with each other. And according to the definition that you have seen here, you can call this bond, you can call this interaction as intermolecular interaction, right? So because in case of ammonia, you have intermolecular interaction, what happens is the molecules will be interconnected to each other. They'll form a network rather. The first ammonia molecule is connected to second, second is connected to third, third is connected to fourth and fourth and third are connected to each other and this networking goes on. Because of this networking what happens is the first ammonia molecule is bound to second, second ammonia molecule is bound to third. As this bounding is happening between the adjacent molecules, they stay united. The step among this the sample will increase because of increased stability what happens is if I want to boil the sample the ammonia molecules will pull 
the adjacent molecules towards themselves as a result of this i would have to supply more energy to break these intermolecular bonds that's why in case of ammonia the boiling point is more so the reality actually is because of the intermolecular hydrogen bonding i hope you could understand this concept let us quickly recap whenever you want to compare the melting points and boiling points quickly look at the molecular mass and boiling point relation if this is valid then your problem is solved but if this is not valid like in this question reality and the expectation are contradicting with each other then you have to look for presence of intermolecular hydrogen bonding the samples which contain intermolecular hydrogen bonding comparatively will be more stable so they demand more melting points and more boiling points that's why ph3 has got lower boiling point than nh3 i hope you have understood this in case of any doubts please let me know your doubts in the comment section below let's right now move on to the next question nh3 acts as a lewis base so here is a statement but you need to give the reason behind this statement you need to tell why nh3 acts as a lewis base but to understand that we first need to recap what is meant by lewis base so the concept of assets and bases is been actually explained by a lot of theories of which one is arrhenius theory the second one is bronsted lowry theory and the third one is lewis theory right now we are working on this lewis base which means we are looking at what looking at the third theory which is lewis theory theek okay? hai so according to lewis theory what is a base base is a substance which can donate a pair of electrons which can donate a pair of electrons is considered as lewis according to is considered as lewis base according to lewis theory all right so nh3 acts as a lewis base in the question they are stating that nh3 is a lewis base but you have to tell them the reason what could be the reason if you want to call something as lewis base that should be donating a pair of electrons look at the structure of nh3 in nh3 nitrogens atomic number 7 configuration 1s2 2s2 2p3 these three electrons of 2p will be involved in chemical bonding with with three hydrogen atoms as you see in the structure right and what about these 2s electrons present here they are still available in the valency shell but not participating in any chemical bonding so they are free because they are free you call them as lone pair of electrons and these lone pair of electrons are available to be donated in case of nh3 nitrogen can donate the lone pair of electrons from 2s that's why it acts as a lewis base any species that can donate a pair of electrons is a lewis base by nature theek hai now let's move on to the next question next question is no2 dimerizes and even here you have to tell the reason why does no2 dimerize to understand what is meant by dimerization let us quickly work on a few concepts so there are a few molecules which can exist as monomers what is meant by monomer right now so monomer is a species is a molecule which can exist independently if there is a molecule which is existing as it is you call it as a monomer and if you have two such monomers connecting with each other you call it as a dimer so two monomers bind with each other with the help of a proper chemical bond and because of this binding because of this binding through chemical bond what do they get is they attain stability it is just like just imagine the monomer is not stable due to some reason and it is seeking some support from the adjacent monomer that's it so in the question they are saying that no2 dimerizes they already stated that no2 dimerizes which means no2 is a molecule which have some issues with stability so it is seeking out support of adjacent no2 molecule and the support is of course through a chemical bond but then you have to tell the reason here you have to state the reason behind this dimerization so what could the reason be to understand the reason you would have to take a look at the structure of no2 here in case of no2 nitrogen is a central atom and there are two oxygens adjusted adjacent to the position of nitrogen theek hai so observe nitrogen here nitrogen's configuration in general is what it is 1s2 2s2 2p3 which means it has got five electrons in the last shell which means it can share totally how many electrons it can share three electrons this is like the technical data original data but look at the structure that you have here nitrogen is sharing an electron with the first oxygen atom nitrogen is sharing the second electron with the first nitrogen atom so sorry the first oxygen atom and the nitrogen is having one electron over here so here is one electron involved in sharing second electron in sharing one electron freely available totally three electrons 
What about the remaining two electrons of nitrogen? Where have they gone? They are invested in bonding with the adjacent oxygen, with the second oxygen atom. But why are two electrons involved? That is because nitrogen maximum can form only three bonds. If nitrogen is forming only three bonds, what about the valency of the second oxygen atom? It will not be satisfied, right? In order to satisfy the valency, what does nitrogen do is it will donate a pair of electrons to oxygen. So the second bond that you see between nitrogen and oxygen here is a dative bond by nature. Because it is a dative bond, two electrons are invested. So here is one electron, here is second electron, here is third electron, here is fourth and fifth electron. Are we clear? And now observe. If this is how the electrons are distributed in NO2, how many electrons are available with nitrogen now? It's only one single electron and this one single electron is called as odd electron, right? So presence of odd electron is not stability. Any species which have got odd electrons does not exist in a stable manner. That is why nitrogen is a little unstable and it wants to stabilize itself. By doing what? By sharing this odd electron with the adjacent nitrogen's odd electron. There are two NO2 molecules. Each of them have got one odd electron. The odd electron of the first nitrogen and the odd electron of the second nitrogen are shared. And as a result of this sharing, what happens? The dimer will be formed. So NO2 dimerizes due to presence of odd electron in order to stabilize itself. So I hope you have understood this. In case of any doubts, please put down your doubts in the chat box. I mean, in the comment section below. And also, if you want a database of all of these questions from P block elements, I'll be including the link in the description box below. You'll get the complete notes of this kind of reasoning based questions in P block elements from the description box below. All right. For now, let's move on to the next question. Here you go. NH3 is a stronger base than PH3. So this question is also a statement that we are supposed to state the reason as an answer for this question. So in the question, they are saying that NH3 is a stronger base than PH3. They already have stated NH3 to be stronger base than PH3. But before a while, we have spoken about this basic nature, isn't it? Why is ammonia basic by nature? Because it has capacity to donate its lone pair of electrons. And same is the case with phosphorus. Why? Because nitrogen and phosphorus belong to the same group. And they are present in this sequence when it comes to group. Nitrogen comes first and phosphorus comes later. And due to this arrangement, what happens is there are a few periodic trends that vary like what like nitrogen has got only two shells isn't it so first shell and second shell what about phosphorus it has got three shells first second and third when you look at the size of nitrogen and phosphorus nitrogen is smaller in size when you compare to phosphorus right so because of that what happens is nitrogen will be smaller sized atom and phosphorus comparatively is a bigger better sized atom and now because of this, the surface area of nitrogen is comparatively lower than that of phosphorus, isn't it? Because of low surface area, the distance between the lone pair of electrons and the three bond pair of electrons is comparatively low. All of these electron pairs are closely arranged and due to this close arrangements, there will be repulsions observed between the bond pairs and lone pairs. Because of this repulsions, what happen is the nitrogen will be fed up of these repulsions and the nitrogen here in NH3 will be ready to donate the pair of electrons. And anything which can readily donate the lone pair of electrons or easily donate the lone pair of electrons is considered as a strong base again according to Lewis theory. In case of NH3, because nitrogen has got a ready availability of lone pair of electrons due to its own smaller size and greater repulsions, NH3 is a stronger base. But in case of PH3, what is the situation? In case of PH3, the phosphorus is bigger atom, so bigger surface area in comparison to nitrogen. So the distance between the bond pairs and lone pairs is better than that of NH3. It's not super good, but it's better. It's at least better than NH3. So PH3 comparatively will be willing to retain its lone pair of electrons because of less repulsion. So PH3 is a weaker base and ammonia is a stronger base. So this is all the sequence of questions that I wanted to discuss today. If you want more such questions, you can pick it up from the notes in the description box below. And if you want me to explain more such reasoning based questions, let me know the same in the comment box. I hope this video helps you and I'll see you in one other video. Until then, bye from my side.